Okay, um, so it's Wednesday again. Um, it's my third time. Is it, do I say third time or yeah, first Wednesday? Third time. Third time. Um, oh, yeah. Third time doing this. Then I um. Well, I'm 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 reading the book Alchemist as well. I thought um. So maybe I need to talk about some stuff while I'm painting, and I'm regretting it big time because um. It's difficult, <laughs> and I um I gave up on the whole makeup thing. I just decided I can't be fucked. Anyways, so um, <laughs> I'm going to do this again, and um excuse me if I speak really slow because it's hard to remember the book content. I mean, it's a great book. It's a great book, but wish I didn't have to read it again. I feel like the last time I concentrated on reading this much was back when I was in high school and that was way too long ago. Mm, anyways, so I've um, got so bad with that's my husband. Hello. Yeah, okay. Um, all right. So, oh, well, I'm having, we're having a baby soon. So we've got all the baby gear shipped today. Yay. <laughs> um okay so today i'm going to be doing the hosta plant part so um this whole left side is done now but i've got the whole bright side and the bear pregnant bear lady and it's just too much left i think i'm going to try to aim maybe two months to try to finish this painting Good luck to me. Um, so it says hosta plants. So I was doing um, fucking hell, what is this thing called? Pregnant brain. Uh, I was doing bird of paradise plants. So and I've moved down here, and this is a slightly different green tone to the the lush green at the top. I'm going to be using a bit more um yellow. So I've got, I've got cadmium yellow. Keep saying pool connection. Um, cadmium yellow medium, and I don't really have much left of this. Um, hook is green by Windsor and Newton. And I actually did a smart thing and bought a whole new one. Yay! Um, usually when I know I'm gonna use a lot of colors, I just buy a couple and instead i wish they had a had a bigger bottle but they don't for these little ones um so i'll be using thalo green yellow and also permanent green light um matisse brand i usually use a different brand by by atelier interactive which i'm trying to look for. it keeps coming out um, I don't know why the internet keeps dropping because we're meant to have good internet. But anyways, I usually use um into uh what is it interactive um version of the permanent green light. The every brand has a different, slightly different tone. Oh, you can't. This one is a bit more um. I would say it has a bit more of a bluish tone than the interior, uh, sorry, interactive. I'm going to, well, I'm going to be using the Matisse one today. And I use this uh, white paint. I buy it in a, a, a big liter bottle. This is a really good one. I found this brand when I moved to Europe. It's Studio La Source. It's really creamy and thick, this titanium white. And um, it's pr pretty much, I think this is the best um, professional white acrylic paint I've used. That's a good one. Okay, so um, same brushes. Um, probably not the bigger one I use for um, like a base coat because all my paintings, um, um, there's a lot of layers underneath. And because I use... Um, really hard linen if you don't put a certain, um, some sort of layer underneath it's sort of hard to fill in the um, rough grooves and I've got these little paint brushes 
by Da Vinci. So I've got a multiple of this flat brush. It's sort of like, I don't know if you can see it. It's going up. It's going its way out. I've got a new one, but you gotta sort of like get to this sort of like a scuffling sort of perfect level. It's sort of beyond perfect, so I'm gonna I think I wanna use it again this time, but probably start with a new brush afterwards. Okay, I'm going to start painting now. Thank you. Just squeezing out some paints quickly. So my having a green light. So this hosta plant, they have different types. I want to use, I don't know if you can see this. Can you see that? Yeah. So I'm going to um, paint a hosta plant that has like a creamy white edges. I don't actually have a good reference photo, so I'm going to have to use a lot of imagination, which I don't really like to do. When I'm painting leaves, plants, but try, oh my god, it's hot, I've got to take my clothes off, check it, Oosh. Uh, okay, so with the alchemist book, I'm up to the level, not level, up to a part where, so Santiago, the main character, has been working in the crystal merchant's shop in Tangier in Morocco. So that was his um, first adventure since leaving Andalusia after being a chef shepherd. And in the last session, he was really, he's being really naive and silly and he got robbed of all his money. So he ended up working for these crystal merchants and shop basically after Santiago joined the shop it really thrived and the merchant uh, was his boss basically his boss gained a lot of success they he had to hire um, two more new employees so for the whole time um, Santiago has been working at the shop. He was like the employee of the month. And I'm up to where he's been working at the shop for about 11 months and nine days. And okay, let me just do this first. So a little bit of white. Tinsy, tinsy, tinsy bit. I'm just gonna make my mark. I'm gonna do this. Okay. Um. Anyway, so yeah, he's been working there for. 11 months, I think he sort of like made enough money to move on. Like his face, his, his chap, well, that chapter of his life is it, closing and he feels like he can move on now to his next step. And his, his plan was to um, make enough money to go back to Andalusia to be shepherd again but this time a rich shepherd instead of getting well he had enough he made enough money in, in 11 months to buy what 120 sheep he initially had 60 but done well so 120 sheep and he made enough money for a ticket back home to Spain and also had enough money to buy a license 
to import products from Africa. Right, let me just think. Shoot. Okay. Enough money to. Yeah. What? Well, yeah. What? Well, like, go back to Spain. You're. You're like the big man. Made a lot of money in a foreign country. So that was his um idea. Anyway, so that morning he woke up. Got dressed in his um white Arab clothes and headscarf and a headband that's made of camel skin. So already, it, like within eleven months. He's really adjusted to his new life, and I thought it was really impressive. I think 11 months is quite quick, considering like how he was in the beginning. He was only 18 years old, really naive, and had a bit of, um, what do you call it? Um, I can't, I'm painting. Um, had a bit of, um, oh, what do you call it? Discrimination as well. Well, it all comes from not knowing. But from then to now, he was able to speak full Arab and really in integrated himself well into the. Oh my goodness, this is going to be really difficult for me. Um, into the culture. He made himself sandwich. What, well, he woke up really early. Made himself some sandwich. Had um, hot tea in crystal glass. The idea that he came up with serving tea in crystal. Um... And smoke some hookah. Goodness. Smoke some hookah and thought about what he achieved at the crystal shop. And I thought all that was quite impressive. I've been living in Germany for three years now. My German is still pretty bad. Really difficult language. I would think any new language is really difficult for him to do it within the like month. It's like a smart, smart guy. Okay, so that's just a base tone. Um, I don't know where to put. Um, anywho, I'm really doing a bad job at storytelling today. I'm going to start again. Um, Okay, so, oh god, this is really difficult. So he's made enough money, planned to go back to his old life, and then he saw the, well, he saw his boss and told the boss basic, like, well, he told the boss it's time for him to leave. And the boss said, babe, he was like, yeah, I could see that. I could see that happening. Off you go. But 
the crystal merchant authors said that um what the crystal merchant said to Santiago that as much as I know that I'm not ever going to go to Mecca which was his personal legend or legend meaning his dream he also knows that Santier is not going to go back to being a shepherd so Santiago is like how do you know and the boss goes he says maktub maktub I think that's right maktub it's a word that means it is written so he's saying well it's fate that's what he's saying basically it's fate that he's not going to go back to being a sheep herder anyways all that aside so Santiago starts packing his bag determined that he was going to go back to Spain and then he finds his old shepherd's pouch he's like oh I haven't seen that in a while opens it up and then two stones fall out and it's the Urim and Urim and Turban the stones that were given to him by the the old king Melchizedek in but the first part of the book seems like this stone appears whenever Santiago is sort of like gets headed in the wrong direction in his goal achieving oh god I need to concentrate here. um yeah so I think it appeared because he was going to give up on his dream to go to Egypt instead go back Go back to um, Spain and be like the crystal merchant. Just live content, comfort, but without having realized his dream. So as soon as the stone falls out, it sort of um, makes Santiago think about all the things that the things that the old king said about how um how um if you really want something the universe conspires to help you achieve it but that initial thought i think santiago kind of scoffed at because he he was like well the old king didn't say anything about being fucking robbed losing everything and he didn't tell me about the desert being so freaking far and then also that pyramids were just a bunch of stones he didn't tell me any of that so i think he felt a bit, a bit of resentment towards that so he's, he's like well, you know, I'm still gonna go to Spain and get them a sheep. I'll be a rich sheep herder. And so, makes up his mind and leaves the shop without saying goodbye because he doesn't want to cry. It's such a boy thing to do. I totally feel it was me. I'd say goodbye and have a have a good cry because. <laughs> beautiful <laughs> but um you know he did the whole no no I'm not gonna cry so I'm not gonna say goodbye and then left and then left um ended up back into the same um 
same ball that he first came. When he first came, it's that ball where he met that met that dude who spoke Spanish and robbed his all his money. But this time it was quite different. He wasn't a newcomer anymore, and like she felt like he had conquered Tangier and he was feeling big and proud and he felt like he could conquer the world if he could conquer Tangier. I, I would feel pretty proud too. Like within less than a year, he made a lot of achievement. That's really impressive. Alright. Um, and then he was sitting there. Thinking about all his achievement and holding the arm and thumb, he told himself, "Okay, yeah, I'm going back to do what I wanted to do. I mean, not what I wanted to do, what I used to do. The more and more I said it, it he wasn't so happy about." the decision and then well in the end he did just decides you know what I can see I can um go back to be a shepherd anytime I want go back to my comfort life anytime I want but I only have one chance one chance only to go to Egypt and see the pyramids. So he ends up changing his mind. Which I was really glad that he did. And then realized, it's like, oh, how am I going to get to freaking Egypt again? And then remembered that his boss, Crystal Merchant dude, has his um, shipment delivered by a caravan that crossed the desert. And when that idea came, he was like, oh, awesome, pretty much. And then remember the old King Melchizedek saying that, okay, so, this is like a, a shiny bit here, so mm. wow, this is really difficult. Um, old man saying that I'm always nearby when someone wants to realize their personal legend. Like, if you really want something, I think you can always like. There's always a way shown to you by the universe. I was thinking about all that and then relating back to my life. Mm, I think like a lot of people would have the similar sort of experience, I guess. One point or other in their life. But um I'm trying to think of what my dream was before the artist thing. So when I first came to Australia, when I was 12, things were really difficult. Obviously, it would be very difficult for a child to live alone in a foreign country with no care given. And many times, what well, was pitifully lonely and really hard when you meet a lot of bad adults. I just did a lot of free had this. And um, yeah, so I wanted to, well, there, were, there were a few times when I was young that I wanted to go back to Korea. And I remember my mom, mom my mom, was also having a difficult time because she was a single mother 
and it was very difficult for her as well. So she she said to me, I think I must have been 16, um, and I'd already, well, well, it's quite personal, but I'd sort of um, tried to kill myself a couple of times. And she said, like, if it's that dis difficult for you, you, you could just come back. And I remember thinking, like, it was that difficult, but I don't want to give up. I'm already, I'm already so, like, I don't know, for me, like, going back with, going back on things, like, even nowadays, is never an option. Sort of, I think it sort of started when I was quite young. One night in a bit of, um, stellar green blue. I think there's a bit of a blue bit. Um. So I guess I needed to, uh. I don't know, find the best way forward with things if I didn't want to give up. And that's it's in a way similar to what happened to um what happened to Santiago. Like how we ended up working with Crystal Merchants Place and that sort of led into learned that there's a caravan which I think for me is um it's a vessel okay. it's a route in his life a ride basically that will help him move closer towards his goal and I think I've always had small goals growing up and they were basically just in survival. So my goal back then was to be strong, I guess, mentally healthy. And what happened was that when I decided that these things that I was doing wasn't because I wanted to really die, but I really needed some sort of structure and help in, in my life. And I remember thinking about it when this was all happening. And then what happened was that I think in my second stint at the hospital, the hospital somehow um, decided that I needed help and I'm really lucky that they did that and because I was underage they um, found me like a what do you call those things like a um, government housing for kids who didn't have home and it, it, the places are run by um, run by um, councillors so you get a room we can stay in and councillors have like a council office downstairs in part of the house and what they do is um they help these kids that come by who doesn't have a home like basically because i didn't have home um structure in their life like chores and stuff and from what i learned is that I knew already at 16, 17 why things were difficult with me because the fact that nobody cares about you, like they don't, they don't care if you do any wrong, they don't care if you do any right, like you know even as a child that, that you are alone and feeling completely alone is what is I think most difficult, like completely alone, like no connection to anyone, like nobody cares is is the most difficult thing a child or anybody can go through really 
Um, so it just, like it took me a while to get adjusted to the environment because I was so used to not <laughs> having been told what not to do. And I had these people who were giving me chores and I remember being a real dick shit in the beginning. But like I was like a feral cat, basically. But more as the time went on, um, I don't know, I didn't get kicked out and I think it gave me a sense of like, I like, I, those kids, including me, like they're little dick shits because they don't trust people and the reason I was like that in the beginning was that I, I, I had this feeling deep inside that, well, why would, like, I know they're not gonna, um, they don't care and that like no you just don't want to get hurt so so you become um you know become a difficult kid but more as the time went by I realized that wasn't the case and I adjusted and I became a real 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 good kid not staying there so in a, in a, I don't know like if you could see it sort of similar but I mean this is a book if it wasn't a book and if it was based on life experience like if if I didn't have that happen to me and that was also giving up comfort or well, comfortable would be just to be by on, on my own and not listen to anyone but by giving up comfort I did end up getting closer to my personal goal which was well no I don't think anyone wants to be a bad child like I want it to be good and I did um, stayed there till, so I, so, like, I guess in a way it's like finding my caravan across the desert, because the thing is, like, Santiago still needs to go, like, across the desert to get to his real goal, so there's just these, I guess, challenges or just a path that will lead him to his ultimate, ultimate goal. And like I said, my ultimate goal was, well, to be good as, as well as to be, um, free of, like, Pain. I had um so I think sixteen seventeen I was on three different medications because of my depression and I had um well they called it something different back then but I found that it was actually called um complicated, is it complicated? Complicated post-traumatic stress disorder, so PTSD. So um, I was on antidepressant and mood stabilizer and sedative. I mean, I got cleared of it when I was 18, so I could, I didn't have to be on the medication. But well, that was sort of the ultimate goal, to be free of all that. And to be free of all these things is like crossing the desert. It's quite a difficult road and there's always a detour. Nothing's easy. But ultimately, like in the book, you do get to your goal. And like long story short, I'll 
both like I'll talk about this more in detail as the book goes along but last like I don't have any of those problems. I don't not on any medication and haven't for a long time and last time I ever had a panic attack was or even similar even like a remote anxiety or whatever was probably when I was 25 and I'm 36 now so yeah it's all good so anyway so back to the book so now we're at the part where Santiago decided no he's not gonna be a chauffeur again going to achieve his dream okay so now i think i sort of gotten no i gotta get this face bit ready um yeah so good off he goes he's going to go find the caravan and now the next it switches to a new character the englishman i don't really like this character he reminds me of some like really annoying people that I'm I've met <laughs> in the past. Like a little bit of a not all twerp. Anyway, so this guy the, is a new character, so he's a new foil um to the main character. I had to look up what foil is because I'm not quite like wasn't really into literature. Um because the crystal merchant was a foil character as well so basically what foil means is I really liked it when I looked it up so when you had put a foil down like an aluminum foil and put a jewel on top of it it makes the jewel shine so basically a foil character is a um, character that's used in the book to make the, the main character shine Ah, that's a really good metaphor so he's a foil character and um, this guy also believes in omen and like the crystal merchant I feel like these people that make some sort of impact okay wait so it is crease bits in the white bit and I gotta figure out what color that is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I'm just gonna do a um yeah so he's this Englishman has spent pretty much all his life says the book Searching and studying for um, language of the universe. I kind of like they talk about this language of the universe thing a lot, and to be honest, um, eh, sometimes I don't quite understand. Like it, the book gets, a, it gets quite. Like they talk in these metaphors a lot from now on and then mm, I had to kind of like read a few times and back into back and forth into like what the author's about to, to fully sort of just try to understand it properly. Anyways, so he's trying to find the language of the universe and to do so would try he's said it said he's studied um esperanto and esperanto i also looked it up because i was like nah, i feel really dumb when i don't know these things when i'm reading the book I'm like, oh, what the fuck is esperanto now so basically a universe language that uh, some Polish dude came up with in 18, 1887 um, it's a mix of pretty much all languages except Asian because <laughs> we're not universal <laughs> um, yeah it's made of English 
and Spanish and Slavic and oh freaking hell what it what's it French and oh, I'm not sure if I missed any Oh, it doesn't have Arabic either. Well, anyway, that's Esperanto that this guy came up with, but no one really, didn't really catch on. Good on him for making it, though. Um, so he, the Englishman studied Esperanto, and then he studied world religion, and now he lives on to alchemy. Finally, alchemy, not the book's title based on. Uh, and he was saying how he cave okay, is like he's mastered mastered Esperanto knows all about the world religion but alchemy was really difficult because apparently the alchemists weren't like quite nice at, in a way that they, they want, didn't really want to share information and I'm not sure if anyone's an artist here, and I don't really know many artists because I'm not in the artist community, but I don't know, like, I feel like maybe, like, artists don't really share much information either, I think. I mean, like, correct me if I'm wrong, and I don't know, like, they're nice, nice artists out there, but I, I don't really ask for help. I, I mean, I think I did in the beginning when I first started sort of dibbling into it, but I don't know, I found that, um, I don't know, maybe it could be the, be, be the like, you know, out as a personality or something, or it could be that. Well, if in my case, because I'm quite, I'm a bit, a little bit guilty. Like, I am. I, I admit, I'm a bit guilty. I love helping people, and I've um given other starting artists information and you know how to get themselves out there. Like, oh, there's this exhibition here and group exhibition there. Like, you could try this and try that. But then if they start asking more questions, I was sort of like, you know what? It took me so long, <laughs> so long to get these information myself, like years. And you can keep asking me, like, just do your own research too. And I feel really bad for doing that, but I feel really bad, but I don't know. I feel like a real bitch. But I think alchemist as well in the book they said that what well, the Englishman thinks the reason why um, they didn't really share information of what they learnt or what the findings were is because well to be an alchemist it takes a lot of years of study a lot of years of effort and a lot of years and I think and after that they're just like you know fuck you why don't you do the fucking work <laughs> um anyway so <laughs> Englishman spent most of his life looking for this language of the universe and basically spent most of his father's money to find in the philosopher's stone i to be honest before this book the only time i've heard of this was from harry potter and even still then i didn't really look into it because i thought it was just a just, i thought it was just the title but when it appeared here i kind of figured oh you know maybe it is more than the title i should look into that so, um, Philosopher's Stone is like a term in alchemy where apparently um, it 
it's a stone that can turn uh, every metal into like every base metal into gold so um i think they said how to get it it's like you you have to boil down this metal for a very very long time and when they gave me an example as a base metal like i think it said um some, something like mercury so they boil down the metal for very 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 long time very very long time and then like it takes all the impurities away so i'm just going to use a big brush and do a glaze over um yeah and then you get left with two parts of things so that there's a liquid part which is called elixir of life and then there is the solid part which is the philosopher's stone and the liquid part keeps you all young basically so it helps the alchemist live for a long 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 time anywho so he heard the englishman i'm talking about he heard from his friend who was on a excavation trip was something like that um from egypt and his friend said that hey dude i heard i heard that there's this alchemist this arabian alchemist in al fayyam oasis that's lived it's like 200 years old and and um has discovered the philosopher's stone so the englishman is like oh well i'm gonna go meet him so that's his personal legend to find the philosopher's stone hence on his way to al fayyam egypt to achieve his dream so when i was saying he spent all his money well most of his it was father's inheritance his father so he must be a well off dude and he spent most of his dad's money researching and studying for it and bought all these fancy ass books alchemy books from a long time ago just to search for it and decided that you know just reading a book is going to help him so it like off his way on his way to our fame uh, so that's how Santiago and um I can't do a couple of white here Santiago and and he meet and um, Englishmen meet they bond over um, the Orem and Thurman stone because the Englishman both like the Englishman also had it and so sort of understood where it came from and then they start talking about their personal legend Santiago reveals that he's on his way to find the treasure which he kind of regretted immediately after and I wanted to kudos him for that so good on you like you don't trust anyone don't tell any strangers he learned that I think he learned that from getting robbed no yeah, it was like those experiences really like they they do steal you I mean you have to if, if you've done you've got a problem when I was growing up I, I got my more you know like if you say rob let's say rob like i rob quite a bit if you don't have any protection people do that they think they can take your things and they do so it 
kind of like made me into an adult who is quite overly protective. And I always, um, every time I do things, I check things like two, three times at least, make sure everything's in, everything's in, um, everything's in check. Because I've had so many experiences of that sort of stuff happening. Uh, it's, I think, in a way, I do like that I am a person who's very careful, but also at the same time, when I catch myself being that way a bit much, I kind of do feel a little bit sorry for myself, like, a little bit like, I wish I had a bit of more of a naivety, because it kind of shows that I didn't have such a difficult life, but it's like, when I kind of see, I catch myself being obsessed over safety and caution. I'm like, oh, you poor thing. <laughs> oh, what made you this way? Anyways, so when when Santiago did that, I was, I was like, oh, I relate to you. But you do have to be careful. Anyway, luckily, he didn't have to worry about the Englishman. The Englishman basically just replied and said, well, you know what, in a way, I'm searching for my treasure too. And I think, to be honest, like, in the Englishman's mind, he's probably thinking his treasure is better anyways because it's a bit pompous. And also at the same time, if you find the metal that turns everything into fucking gold, then I think in a lot of people's mind that is better treasure than whatever whatever the shepherd boy is looking for honestly like if you look at it in, in that way I'm can be a bit cynical so um yeah off they go talking and then an Englishman like starts going on about omen this is all like omen and whatnot and Santiago you know omen loving guy it's like oh I'm really glad I'm in this caravan with this dude who seems so wise and I mean, they bond well in the beginning, but over the course of the ball, I don't think it really works out for either of them. It's just like one of those people that just don't really, like, a bit too different. And then the next scene moves on to the caravan leader. Caravan leader. Um, making a speech basically saying, you know, in the desert, you follow me or you die. Capiche. And everyone's like, praying to whatever religion they have. Um, so this is a really big caravan. There's 200 people and about 400 animals mules and fowls and horses and this and that. Um, Alright, before I move on to the next story, I'm going to further this bit out. So, shine, shine, shine. I have to do this carefully. So light to dark, light to dark, light to dark. Let's start from here. Light. To dark. Okay, so 
so um, this caravan is headed to east. They traveled in the morning and rested when the heat was too much. Even that is a is a good metaphor. Metaphor that when you so when you have a goal, I guess. Sometimes um I mean there's never a shortcut but also at the same time um, you need to sort of pace yourself because if you don't pace yourself like them camels the rider won't be able to handle the stress which is true like you put too much pressure on and that just leads to um, all your camel collapsing basically and this was the first time for what's his face um Santiago to be um in the desert so he was observing the desert and I really like the metaphor they was using about this desert, like so during the trip there's times where Wait a second, I think I did this wrong. Ah fuck me, I did this wrong. It's the other way around. Ay 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 ay. So it's dark to light, dark to light, dark to light. Um, so the desert is a very harsh condition as Santiago observed. There's a lot of wind, um, there are a lot of detours sometimes. Okay, sometimes, um, to night where's the light um yeah sometimes there's like boulders where the path was they have to take a detour and sometimes <laughs> Sometimes, um, that like sometimes the, the sand is too hard for the camel or too soft for the camel, so with that reason, they had to they would have to um, take another detour. Let's that's quite like relatable in terms of um more what happened to me as well. That it took me about maybe nine, ten years. No, a bit longer than that. Like mental, mental, mental illness and, and, and trauma and whatever. Like it really, sometimes it takes forever for people to overcome completely. And it's not just one or two. There's, it's like an interwebs of many different complicated issues that sort of like human mind is very, um, Man, it's just plant is surprisingly hard. Yeah, human mind is very complicated. So if you unravel one thing then you'll find there's another and then another and then another. Sort of that way.
Um, yeah, so for me, there were a lot of up and downs in my process. And when when there was a detour, uh, it was really hard for me because I'm a very impatient person. I just wanted to get better, and I was very frustrated with why I wasn't getting better and why things weren't getting better. And there's a really good metaphor in there, which is talked about by this camel driver that Santiago makes friends with. We'll get to that in a bit. So, um, like, Santiago gets told later, I think, in the book that all these difficulties people who are in pursuit of the personal legend these um, detours are like tests the inherent part of all personal legend because it creates spiritual growth and it really does when you I guess in, in, in the way they speak when you um they speak when you achieve your personal legend it's not the actual goal itself that is rewarding it's what you learnt um along the way that really makes a difference i f feel like what i've learnt along the way to be honest, it is a lot more useful in my life than the actual bit. I and mean, the actual bit is also great, but that's, that's more like the fruit you get at the end. And it's hard work overcoming um, mental issues, like it's not easy. You really have to do hard work every day. To achieve it, guess. Um, and you need to, um, well, you need to be, you need to be aware that. Uh, it, I mean, it's hard to, but you need to be aware that you're not gonna, you're not gonna achieve what you want to achieve in 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 few years. It, it, for me, I did a lot of research and I did, I had a lot of um, cognitive behavioral therapy books because I learned that brain is like, it, it is like muscle. Same as exercising, you need to sort of reroute your brain and by training you can do that and it really helped that was sort of start of it but also first would be to recognize the reality oh god i have to pee oh look Santiago, you've got to really observe the surrounding. So what he does is that he 
learns a lot from the desert because he does a lot of observing. I don't really know. Um, how, how, how does he do it? So he's looking at how caravan and the desert is all connected. Bit bit fluffy fluff for me, but good on him and. The desert itself in harsh condition has life. And by making friends with this camel driver who is really like a wise dude, he learns a lot about being in the present moment as well. Am I doing this right? Yeah, I think that's a really important thing that the, uh, this camel driver, because I'm going to get to him now, so he is this new, sort of like a, I wouldn't say new character, it is a character that Santiago makes friends with, and he's sort of like similar to so merchant in a way that his dream was to go to Mecca and he does and he says okay so hang on a second I mean, so this guy's from El Cairo had it Orchid and family, and then you know, went to the Mecca and he was like, Oh, I could die happy, and got all complacent. And and then an earthquake happened, and the Nile River overflowed and basically ruined all his crops. I say so. So, hang on a second, I gotta figure this out. Brain. Um, this goes dark, dark light, dark light, I'll oh, figure it out, um, yeah, it's all could all die, died off, so I had to, you know, get back into making new way, like money in a different way, that's why I became a camel driver, and he's learned that he said that it was a teaching of Allah that people need not to fear the unknown if they are capable of achieving what they need and want I read that and I tried to understand that to be honest and it was a bit hard because I'm like if they're capable of achieving what they need and want well how do they how do people know what they like if they're capable of that like that something I found a bit hard to understand. Someone's gonna have to explain to me what that was about. Um yeah and he says he also says something that I don't understand either. He says to Santiago says to Santiago that the desert's so huge, horizon so distant, it makes the person feel so small, as if he should remain silent. <sighs> Made me feel really dumb, I didn't really quite understand it. Well, it, well Santiago says he intuitively understood that. I couldn't quite intuitively understand it. I think maybe I did, like it sort of continues off from back and front. Because mm. then he talks about the desert and what he learns about the desert. Well, I guess really difficult for me, to be honest. Anywho. Oh yeah, like, um, learning to how all of the desert has detours, like, because the caravan was headed in the east. Like it doesn't change the compass. 
let that just keep going. Still don't get it. Anyways. Well, there's a cool part in it where um, Santiago says all cool, cool stuff about intuition. So that he had, something else about intuition was that it was a sudden immersion of soul that's universal current of life history of all people are connected and able to know everything and it's all written there wait i just sat there and i just didn't get what i just say Ooh. what was it yeah that's an intuition well it basically like Intrusion is something that you get because of all people connected and are able to know everything. I don't know, I thought it was quite nice. Whatever. Um, I have completely lost track of it. This is quite difficult. Yep. So. Seems like Santiago is learning a lot from from observing the desert. That he's learning the the universal language by observing. Meanwhile, this English dude has his face his nose stuck on his books and he's not observing anything because he's thing is that oh you learn through books like all the world is in the book I'm like mm, I don't really agree with it I mean I like, sure but like have a look around once in a while can't really do one thing one thing only he's one of those really stubborn guys I really don't like do not like him Mm. <sighs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, during this desert tours, there's like they come across some bed, bed, Bedouins. I don't know if I'm saying this right. It's the people at the Savelle along the caravan route and desert, and they were coming around and like warning, warning, warning the caravan that there was a tri tribe, tribal war happening, which, you know, like frightened people in the caravan. And apparently the fear made the air silent. And to Santiago that was like, you know what, that's like universal language. Good on you. Santiago asked this camel, camel driver if he was scared of the scared of the the tribe war and the camel driver said that well in the desert there's no going back if there's no going back best way of moving forward like you got to find the best way of moving forward and then rest is up to Allah basically rest is up to faith which is true for me in at least um when I make a decision on what I 
what my goal is in my mind like I don't, there's no going back like, yeah, even if like sh like, sh like sh shit's gone bad because sometimes shit will go bad you just have to find a different way forward because like the caravan, the compass is still set. Detour doesn't mean that that that's changed at all where you're headed. So um, with well, my illness, I guess when I was growing up, there were a lot of failures. And I think I noticed, I think I was 18 when I noticed why there were, there were boulders in the road. Like, um, and 18 is, I think it's youngish age, but I mean, it's the same age as Santiago, so if it's in the book, it's not that young. Um, yeah, because my thing was, when things were going well, I was happy, fair, when things weren't going well, I was miserable and I was lost, and the cycle repeats. So then it made me sort of think about why that was happening and, and that I really didn't like that that was happening because I like to move forward. I don't like going around a fucking circle with stuff. That went on for a while, years, and at 18 I thought, no actually 18 I noticed it and then Around about 24, I came up with an answer. The answer was that if you let the, oh my goodness, if you let what, let's, I was going to use my own metaphor, so I, I Let's say life is a roller coaster, and if you just get on that roller coaster, obviously you're going to go up and down, up and down, up and down with it. And the fact that I didn't have any control over how I felt, it really started bothering me. And I was like, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to collapse every time something bad happens in my life. That just makes me feel like I'm not in charge of my life, but life is. And I feel like that's how this character Santiago is. Like he is an adventurer of his life that he made his he makes his choices. He doesn't let the circumstances in life makes choices for him, like the crystal merchant. So, to achieve that, strength, realize there is a lot more inner work to do. And from then on, like that's when I like really got into doing um, cognitive behavioral therapy. And I read a lot of books and I've observed things. And um, things became manageable in life. At least I knew how to mask it in front of people, but it wasn't good enough because 
like every now and then oh god what's going on here yeah every now and then i'll get this real bad um state of anxiety like this constant feeling of um your heart just uh, um just beating really hard and, and then it would send me into a bit of a fritz like oh my god it like what if i go back to being really sick again because when i was really sick so I, I got over the whole depression bit and then in my university um my depression turned into a, a massive panic disorder and that panic disorder um it put a stop to my life i couldn't leave the house i couldn't i couldn't even i had to um postpone my exam at one semester just i think one of them i had to post it because i was about to go and then suddenly i had this massive panic attack and i didn't even know what that was at the time because nobody like nobody sort of told me what what that was so and then i was really lucky because i used to go to emergency units a lot because i didn't know what i had and every time i went these young doctors would just do these you know vital checks and blood tests and tell me everything's fine off you go uh, and then i'll be back there again and, and no one ever told me that and then one day so it was was when i was in university and i had sort of freaked the real bad on panic disorder i went to i went to an emergency unit somewhere in darlinghurst but it wasn't the hospital it was wasn't a hospital but it was um one of those 24 hours place where you can go there for emergency and i had this really old doctor and i guess he's he's sort of like my milk is addict he came and he just held my hand he goes sweetheart you're just having a panic attack and i just looked at it and i was like that's what it's called and i thought like just that relief of knowing what it was oh my goodness just well if you know what it is then you can deal with it if you don't know what it is that's, that's when the problem well it's when things are hard. so when he told me that then well i think they immediately kind of like went to school university counselors and i saw i uh, made appointments and saw um psychologists i couldn't really do that like, for a while because when you're in university i already didn't have any money ever and fucking psychologists are really fucking expensive So I had to deal with things myself and I was offered to be on another medication again, like I was young. They said, oh, you know, if you get on that medication, but like by then I was studying in biomedical science and I've researched a lot about this these um medicines and what they do and they could create um what do you call it um reliancy dependency as well as it doesn't actually fix the issue it just masks the symptoms and for me that wasn't good enough like just masking the symptom isn't going to help me reach my personal um whatchamacallit legend so i said no and i got 
I got this on the university counselor gave me this CD. I still have it. It's really useful. So I wanted this. I actually did like use a lot of like university resources. So for my bachelor's, I went to um, UTS. So people from Sydney might know that. It's university Technology of UTS Sydney. Yeah. Um, before I went to Sydney Uni for my masters, but when I was at, at UTS, um, yeah, they had all these like really nice like student support things. So the CD that that I was given, okay, I think this is done now. I like the look of this. It took me a while because I'm talking, talking and painting is not easy. Sorry, I keep saying it. I'm, I sound like I'm whinging. Okay, I'm gonna move on to this one. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so he gave me this city. It's a UTS city um, made for students. It's only sound like a, a person that works at the university, but it's a stress management city, a self hypnosis. So he gave it to me, and there's like three tracks in it. And the first one, I think is for stress and which is awesome i love this track i haven't listened to it in decade but i still have it just i don't know just just in case something ever happens so what you do is you, you lie on your back in bed so by then with this panic disorder i had massive um severe insomnia as well to be honest, and I was also being haunted. That's another story. The whole ghosty stuff. I've got a lot of ghost stories. Oh, that's gonna be a fun one. Um. So you lie down, and then there's this like really soothing guy's voice, and he goes, "Lie down." That's what it sounds like. Lie down and close your eyes. In the moment, you're gonna like see. So does this whole process of like going down 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 in some escalator and then get you really relaxed and and yeah the whole hypnosis part at the end i'm mostly sort of kind of fell asleep before he got there most of the time so that was really great so i religiously listened to that every single night and my panic attack was so severe like i would always be covered in this cold sweat and it used to happen every like three times a day at least and then from then on it kind of came down to three times a week. And then it kind of came down to um, uh, three times a month and then three times a year and maybe once a year after one week. And I think I mentioned that till 25, I still had this like, Sort of like this anxiety that just wouldn't go away that I was able to mask in front of people and how that all went away was that so things were headed in the right direction for hey Ginny me and then I was then working as a regulatory affairs analyst and um, I got really lucky and got a really good paying job at a big global company so I was starting a new job and as soon as I went there realized the people that I was about to work with wasn't going to be good for me so it was a big life change and also I had um, broken up with boyfriend so it's a bit like a life change again and then um my panic attacks came back it just started coming back randomly 
and by then I was at least starting to cognitive behavioral therapy as well as um I started meditating and and um well my family was Buddhist growing up and I didn't practice it and I started reading all the Buddhist books and and um started sort of uh studying well, all that spiritual stuff and I have I read this book that really helped me and that's that's the book that ultimately cured my panic disorder anxiety full stop like I don't have I don't know the last time I've ever felt that sort of um yucky anxiety feeling so it's called you are here now you are here by buddhist monk called Thich, Thich Nam Han. and the idea is quite same as this camel driver in the book because the camel driver is like oh you well, well Santi was like oh are you scared of the Travel war and camel driver goes, you know, when I'm eating, I focus on eating, when I'm walking, I'm focused on walking. So basically, I, I stay in my present moment, and and whatever happens, um, will be fate. So, um Yeah, with this book, you are here now. It's all about being in present moment. It, it's a really good book. I recommend it to to a few people, and they all really loved it and really helped other people as well. So, if you ever get into it, if you want to like try it, you should. It's quite thin. It's easy to read, but it's an awesome book. I'm following the Buddhist monk, the Thich Nhat Hanh. He's quite famous on Facebook. And the other day, I saw that they were doing like this online workshop, and he said free. I was like, oh, that's nice. And I looked into joining it, and and it says your contribution, <laughs> your contribution would be much appreciated and the contribution was it started from on um, uh, the smallest bit was 50 bucks and then and then it jumped to um, 150 dollars and and whatnot so i uh well it's covid and i haven't really made money so i didn't join that but <laughs> i don't know i just can't thought it was kind of funny hmm. um yeah so i at this moment, I think I mentioned that I was freaking out when I got sick, like started having panic attacks again, that if I was going to, if I was going back to my university level of sickness, because that was really scary. So, but once you start freaking out, then, then you just keep freaking out it doesn't make things better but after reading this book at this moment so i was walking i used to walk along to my workplace uh well we had to catch a train there and then it was sort of about a five no it was like 50 minute walk to the company and along the way there are these hedges so i'd always run my fingers through it trying to stay in that present moment and then one day um, my panic attack just started rallying up again my heart started beating really fast and first I started to kind of freak out a little and then I just immediately I don't know told myself I 
told myself, well, instead of freaking out, I said, I'm grateful that my heart is beating. And literally is the last time I ever, ever had panic attack. And, well, the book really helped, so if anyone is interested, it's the book for you. Thinking about it now, I, um, so, so now, along with my mental care, I really take care of my physical health. I started exercising a lot from 24, I started doing Shaolin Kung Fu and I got really into that and also at the same time I started getting into um, um, health health like supplements and really like look into what my body needs because I didn't well, because they were, yeah, I didn't have anyone looking after me, so no one really taught me how to take care of myself, and I never really ate well. I was really skinny. Kind of wish I was still skinny now. Cause now, um, I'm, well, I don't know, I'm pregnant, but, you know, still a woman. Don't want to be too, anyway, so I'm sidetracked. Um, and... Like in the book, it says that everything's interconnected. The same as like when it comes to your body, like everything is interconnected. Your um, body and mind. Like every time I see these posters, it's like, oh, body and mind is connected. And I want to like, that's so cheesy, I want to vomit, but it really is connected. And I think I figured out like another reason that I had um, really bad panic disorder and anxiety was because I was probably really low on vitamin B as well because I never really um, took any supplements till I was in my mid-twenties and now I'm like real like one of those people who wow you really take care of yourself person not because I'm I'm more like no yeah I'm more like no because I, I just experience what it's like when you don't and like when your mind suffers like it's it's pretty horrible vitamin b is really important especially if you don't take it and if you experience insomnia and the anxiety please take vitamin b uh, and i'm not selling anything so um Shit, what was I talking about that I came here? With the being in the present moment, camel drive on. So what I was saying? Yes, that was what I was saying. So that's like a little side story that happened. Um sorry, I, I, I sidetrack a lot when I talk. So then um oh yeah, and then he moves on to Santiago telling the Englishman. No, that's before, that's after that. Oh yeah, no, 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 no um, yeah. In one of the one of the nights, like they end up talking, and oh, because they, uh, well, the Englishman couldn't sleep, so he's like, oh, probably let's go for a walk along the dune. Like, oh yeah, let's do that. So um, they're talking, and Santiago starts telling him about his success at the. Huh? Oh no, it's so good. Uh, it's right. four hours. Why? What happened? Is it stopped? Greg, has it stopped? No, it's still live. Oh, okay. Um, no, God, now I've lost my place again. This is really difficult when I'm pregnant. I can't. Uh, Just cut out for two seconds. Huh? Just cut out for two seconds. Oh, okay. Um, shit, so where was I? Oh yeah, so the, so the Englishman and Santiago go for a walk along the dune. Dune. Along the dune. 
and Santiago starts telling about his success at the at the crystal shop, and then that's when um Englishman starts talking about the soul of the world. So hang on a second, what happened here? Something happened with the power and Paul is put to low power mode. So I just had to restart it. But the light is still going there. Uh, was it was it coming before or did it stop during that? I'm time? listening to it just so it was two, a few seconds. Oh. Um oh. Yeah, they're on the dune. Okay. Oh my god. Um yeah, so the Englishman starts talking about soul of the world. I still kind of find it hard to understand what that means. So he said that, well, it's basically it's a positive force of the world. It's an alchemy, comes from an alchemy, alchemist term. Um, positive force of the work, well, that works for the betterment of all things, both living and or inanimate object. What? Positive force of the world that works for the betterment. Okay, um, I made a drawing of this. Hmm. I wonder if I can find the drawing. No, it's in my note somewhere. Um, so he's saying that Santiago really wanting something wholeheartedly so or well, everything in the universe helped him to achieve it so that even the the crystal glasses were on his side i don't really know i get what he's saying but yeah no i get it i get it i get it because the thing is there's sometimes like in this book there is a bit of bit of a little bit, bit of, I mean, you can't be perfect. Like, little bits that sort of doesn't really align because I get what he's saying then. But then when Santiago was working at the crystal shop, he wasn't really working. So he would, um like, so he would, you know, like, go to Egypt and find his uh, treasure. He was actually the whole time thinking like he's gonna make enough money to get sheep and go back to his country. So, see, it doesn't, it's, 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 it doesn't like, not com completely, like, know what I mean? It's a great saying, but that was just how I understood. That's what he was working for, really. He wanted to go back to being a, a, a shepherd and then change his mind at, right at the end. So, anyway, so that, that's what he said. Okay. Um, where am I? Now? Oh, yeah. oh, well, I forgot to mention, so during this time, like, again, there's this thing about wind. And I remember when he was in, uh, Santiago was in Andalusia, like, he was standing on top of somewhere that I can't remember, contemplating on going on a new adventure, like, giving up being a, being a sheep herder to find this treasure and then um, he mentioned something about wind blowing from Africa called Leventa and I feel like this wind is a quite symbolic like it, it happens when he like Santiago himself is about to transform so again, in this desert, there's a lot of wind that he mentions, and and after that, he kind of like talks about um, talks about his sheep and 
the gal that he had a crush on, the the gal from the initial bit where he was almost kind of obsessed with that it was a little bit creepy. Um, well, he never met up to like meet this girl again in the book, but there was a girl, and he sort of like let let them all go basically. Um, and yeah, so the wind happens over when there's a transformation within the character. Um, yeah, anyway, so. Like, okay, so Soul of the World, right, June Talk, done that. Um, I feel like I've repeated that. Anyway, so it, it then they start talking about like Santiago starts talking about how much he's learnt being on this trip adventure which fascinates the Englishman and he's like oh you know maybe I should pay more attention to the caravan and with all the Englishmen's fancy ass talk, Santiago is like, oh, you know what, maybe I should read your books. So, well, that's what they start doing in the next chapter, which I'm gonna cover it next time. But, um, where is it again? So, the caravan first Oh, right, yeah, so they share these, like, wise learnings with themselves. I'm not going to really get into it because some of them, I, I don't know, I just don't really get. Like, there's part where they talk about, like, Santiago says, soul of the caravan speaks to the soul of the desert. The de I can't pronounce desert, 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 desert. And the Englishman then goes something like, um, if... What are you laughing about? Husbands are laughing at me. Um, if we joined this trip, like this trip just based on personal courage and not understanding that language, language meaning that Santiago is saying how um, caravan and there's a speak to each other to make the journey happen. So if we didn't understand the language, the journey would be more difficult. Uh, and that um, caravan is... Oh, God. Yeah, so he's like, if you joined only based on personal courage, and not understand that language journey would have been more difficult. Yeah, okay, okay, I, I, I relate to what, what that means. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it sort of goes along the same thing as like a personal goal and setbacks and sort of like understanding how um, well, things are so you don't get all disappointed when things don't work out what well, if you just go by your ego or something like that I, if i'm wrong someone make make a comment because i don't want to seem stupid talking about it yeah so they end up saying stuff like i should read your book and stuff i then the english man goes i should pay more attention to caravan so from next bit which will be them um which will be santiago Finally, like reading about this alchemy stuff in his book, and the Englishman trying to well, he he tries to watch the caravan, but but I read a bit into it. It doesn't really work out for him. I think he's too much of a pompous and. I'm going to cover this again next bit, but he's, I think he says something like, 
he basically thinks doing that, like watching the cat and learning from it, is the primitive way of being. Basically, like for stupid people and smart people, will be learning from books. Ugh. Don't like him. Um, I'm gonna stop here. I just realized it's 10 o'clock already. And I've started this at 8.15, so basically for nearly two hours, I've painted two leaves. Oh, not good, not good. But anyways, um, thank you for anyone who's been standing around to listen to me, Emma, and I'll see you guys next Wednesday. Bye. Bye.